right, hello, and welcome to tonight's author discussion with Dr. Michael Cohen, the author of the book, Modern Political Campaigns, How Professionalism, Technology, and Speed Have Revolutionized Elections. This is a program presented by Loudoun County Public Libraries. My name is Jeremy, and I'm a library assistant in the program department of LCPL, and your host tonight. If you have any questions or comments, please use the chat feature at the bottom, and I will pass them along at the conclusion of our program. We are lucky to have author and PhD holder Michael Cohen here tonight. Dr. Cohen is the CEO of Cohen Research Group, a leading political, public affairs, and corporate research firm. He publishes the pioneering and award-winning Congress in Your Pocket suite of, app, of mobile apps and teaches graduate-level courses at John Hopkins University. Dr. Cohen has been interviewed on camp about campaigns, elections, and political research by numerous news networks and publications. He's a three-time graduate of the University of Florida, He's a native of Long Island, New York, but luckily he lives here in Ashburn. He's lived here for about 25 years with his wife and two kids. For such a topical subject in the news, we're lucky to have someone of his expertise here tonight to speak to us. Thanks for being here, Michael. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So we'll go ahead and pass the things. You should be able to share your screen. Sure. Let me put you over here in the corner, Jeremy. <laughs> that works. <laughs> See if I can do that. So everyone, welcome, to, welcome to the program tonight. I really appreciate you coming. Um, it's it's neat to be able to do this uh, with the library. Um, when you write a book, one of the thing, the big kicks out of writing a book, is saying to yourself, "Wow, you know, maybe one day it'll be in my home library," and you end up in a situation where uh, all of a sudden you find out that it's in the, the library, and then. Um, it was just an incredible um, opportunity to come here and just talk to you about the book um, and, you know, be here to answer a lot of questions that you might have uh, later on. And, you know, I will also give you contact information. So if you have any other questions, you can always just reach out to me afterwards. So let's begin the program. So I'll give you an overview on how campaigns uh, connect citizens to their government and how that's changed over the past 25 years. We'll talk about the, the components of the book um, in terms of uh, professionalism, technology, and speed, and how basically you know, campaigns have changed over the past 25 years. Let's go ahead and say, uh, so by the way, um, you know, thanks so much for LCPL for listing it. If you wanted to go ahead and get the book, you can just go ahead and type in Modern Political Campaigns, and uh, I think you can get it electronically, and I know you can get it physically. And again, that's just such a big kick for me to see that. Um, that's not me. Um, that's me. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> yes, I'm not the other guy. So, if you, so if you thought that I was the other guy, I apologize. Um, I, I promise to be as entertaining as possible. I may not have an ankle bracelet on me. I think it'll be still a fun program. Um, the I've been on the Chuck Pod's Todd Chuck Pod, Todd's podcast, um, the POTUS, uh, Sirius XM radio, as well as. Um, you know, different podcasts and stuff like that uh, later for the book. I did a um, thing for Campaigns and Elections magazine. It's been really a lot of fun to do this. And so for all of you who are thinking about writing a book, I encourage you to do it because in some cases, it's actually a lot more fun and, you know, a lot more work than you would ever think. But the payoff is just so much fun. It's so neat to be able to hold the book in your hand and be like, oh, my God, I wrote this thing. So thanks again for coming. So let me give you an overview on government and how this all came together. So the founders really designed a republic, not a democracy. So one of the things that you probably learned um, somewhere along the way in civics or social studies is that we're a republic and not a democracy. So we vote for the people who actually do the things in government. And this was sort of a really uh, a reaction to what the founders saw in the French Revolution. Uh, the founders favored stability over separation of powers, over democratic energy. And um, James Madison, you know, said it best, the accumulation of powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands basically is a terrible thing and leads to tyranny. Now, in our country, of course, not everyone had a chance to vote right away. And, um, you know, now, finally, 100% of citizens 18 years of age or older can vote. And again, this, was, this is basically a, something that happened in my lifetime. Political parties they were wary of those too. And, you know, our two party system wasn't developed intentionally. It developed out of sort of a disagreement between founders 
and you ended up with separation of powers that helped mitigate the effects. They kind of saw what was coming and they designed the constitution to sort of take care of what probably was going to occur. But the fact of the matter is that they didn't say, well, okay, because we know there'll be two parties, this is how we're gonna design the constitution. So it's one of the things to think about when you think about modern campaigns is how this came together. So 85% of the adults in the groups that at the end of the political spectrum, right around here, this is a Pew Research Center study that just came out uh, last year, um, voted and versus 67% overall. So what that really comes down to is this is that the people who are at the extremes are much more likely to vote. It's kind of like when you're a super fan of a, of a sport, you're much more likely to go to a game. This is the same situation where if you're, you know, a super ideological person, more than likely you are actually going out to vote. You're voting more often than folks who, you know, frankly are just, you know, enjoying their lives. They didn't envision the media explosion that we have seen over the past 25 to 30 years. 1965, the Voting Rights Act is passed. That's only five years before I was born. And you know, now we're looking at things like the first iPhone being released in 2007. We released Congress in Your Pocket actually that year. But 312 million people right now are carrying around smartphones, which I have in airplane mode. Um, and you know, it's a very different environment for media. You no longer have to get your media through TV. You can get it on your phone. You no longer have to watch commercials. You can scan through them. So all of this is just completely changed how we run campaigns now. And the ownership of other devices, now 77% of people now have, you know, some version of a desktop or a laptop. And again, you know, when I was growing up, uh, my first computer was an Apple II Plus. It was one of those clunky things that you'll see on the interwebs. You know, you had a green screen and all that, and you couldn't do very much with it. it was the first program I ever wrote was um, a program so that helped me study Spanish, and now you can just get an app that's a million times better. But anyway, the point is, is that with all of these devices in hand, you now have a much more powerful media environment that can be much more targeted to people individually. But the founders, they definitely knew how to media drop. So when they had Oppo, they knew how to drop it. And so Alexander Hamilton would write out of the New York Evening Post, and Jefferson and Madison would write um, out of the National Gazette. Now, of course, they wrote under pseudonyms, but everybody knew who was writing what. This wasn't an anonymous situation. Everyone knew which papers were being written by who, and they knew their audiences. And so we're now in a situation where our audiences are now watching different pieces. So if you're a liberal, you're watching MSNBC. If you're conservative, you're watching Fox News. And if you're QAnon, you're watching, I guess, uh, OANN. Um, but everyone has their own media now. Every time the country has tried to limit fundraising, it has essentially gone the wrong way. And so when the first federal campaign finance law was passed in 1897. It was basically just to go ahead and limit soliciting money from a specific group of people. And this was naval yard workers for federal campaigns. Since then, Citizens United, McCutcheon, all kinds of other, um, you know, supporting legislation and supporting, um, you know, court cases, they've essentially gone ahead and blown up the system. So if you wanted to give money to a campaign, in large part, there's a way to give money without it even being counted and without even being able to see it at this point. And as you can see over here, the records in spending are just enormous. You know, literally in 2016, we were looking, let me go back for a second. In 2016, we were looking at, you know, just over 6 billion. And in 2020, over $14 billion was spent. It's incredible. And presidential polling, which is sort of my background, um, has always been a work in progress. So I used to work for the Gallup poll. That's where I started off um, my professional career after I worked on campaigns in Florida. And, you know, Gallup kind of blew the 36 race because all he did was is survey someone, people who were reading Literary Digest, which was sort of like The Economist now, a very upscale, very well-informed, uh, you know, literary kind of magazine. And so those people were definitely voting for um, Roosevelt's opponent. 
but in fact, uh, Roosevelt won. And so, of course, we all know about Dewey v beats Truman. And the big problem there was is that the poll, the last poll that was predicting the election was two weeks before the election. And anyone who knows about politics, even back then would have said, my God, that's really crazy. But the polling stopped two weeks before the election. They thought it was basically going to be over, but it wasn't, of course. And uh, Dewey did defeat Truman. And so what you're seeing right now is this, you know, 2.7% was the difference between the real clear politics polling average, which was this, showing basically a 7.2% spread between Trump and Biden. And then the final Biden result, what Trump-Biden result was 4.5%. So that's only a 2%, two, basically a 3% margin of error. Now, for most polls, a 3% margin of error is actually pretty good. So it was it, within the margin of error, it picked the right candidate who was going to win, which is not the spread. So in the area of field operations, um, Lincoln did a rally. Let me go back for a second. I'm sorry. Lincoln did a rally in um, 1860, not you know somewhere out in the open. It was basically at his own home. And so for the vast majority of uh, campaigning in American life, most presidents, most candidates, did not want to seem like that they had too much ambition, even though of course they were all very ambitious. And so campaigns really changed um you know over the past 25 30 years and even a little bit before then in that now there's much more sophisticated data than you could ever imagine when i was first starting 25 30 years ago we had uh we had sheets of paper so that we'd go knock on doors now you have ipads or iphones and you can take surveys while you're there or collect data while you're there on people um, who are going out to vote and or people who may not want to vote or people who may actually be against your candidate. So 1.4 million people attended the rallies in 2016. And um, Giles Parscale, Brad Parscale ended up being his campaign manager in 2020, uh, received over $88 million in 2016. And some of it went to post rally list development. And that's actually where a lot of campaigns are going. You know, social media and all of those kinds of things are great, but they're actually tamping down your ability to be able to use their best tools to go ahead and target voters, basically because of the hacks in 2016 and all the things that happened after that. So what you can do now is if you have lists of your people, you can then upload them to these platforms and then you can get lookalike audiences so that you can then contact those folks or you know, advertise to them. And so there's a huge market right now for not just going ahead and knocking on doors or sending mail or bringing people to rallies, but to basically putting together lists for your own campaign, because then the better the list you have, the better the list of people that you can then market to. And so here's the book. Now let's talk a little bit about professionalism. So with all the new tools, voters have become activists themselves. You know, our expectations of precision are really out of whack. We, we need to understand that with polling, you're not going to be perfect. And so the polls are not lying. The polls are not wrong. They operate within a margin of error. And then the more you do that and the more you understand that, the better. And so, for example, if you look at this one over here, it says Trump plus three, but the rest were Clinton. Trump plus three wasn't right because the popular vote went to Clinton. This would be an outlier. So if you're looking at places like Real Clear Politics and you're looking for polls that are saying anything on the national level, so you might be looking at Biden's approval rating, like there was a, an approval rating that came out a couple of weeks ago um, from, I think it was Quinnipiac, and it was way, way off, um, but it was huge, and so it got a lot of news. You need to look at them in terms of what is the range of the polling that's happening um, during that time period to give you a better sense of really what's going on. Now, political job listings are actually kind of helpful-ish. Like if you actually want to do this for a living, um, the best way, frankly, to do it, and this came through all through the book, no matter who I talked to, whether it was Tony Fabrizio or whether on the right or whether it was someone to Lake on the left or anyone, 
Uh, they would all tell you, look, the best way to get a job in politics is basically just to call a campaign and, and volunteer. And the reason why you do that is because after a while, campaigns kind of figure out who the good people are, and then they hire them full time. And that really gives you a sense of really how a campaign works. And as you're working up through it, it, the best advice that I could give people who are working on campaigns is not to just do your one little thing, but to ask questions of all of the people you're interested in. So if you're interested in digital, go and take the digital director out to lunch. If you're interested in polling, you know, make a phone call and set up some time to Skype or Zoom or, or meet them in person when they come in and give their presentations. It's really a great way to do that. Um, you know, the other thing I would say too is that it really helps to get an introduction to someone um, who works there um, because it, it, these impersonal job lines right here, this is where everyone feels they have to advertise, but the best jobs in politics really are offline. Um, let's go to the next one. So paid and earned media, this is an ecosystem that's been built over the past 25 years. You know, Politico just celebrated, it's I think it's 15th anniversary. The AAPC was not even around when I was in college. Um, Campaigns and Elections Magazine was the only thing that we were able to read that was actually campaignish and interesting. Um, and then now we have things like Startup Caucus's business and politics show that actually walk you through like how politics really works. And now there are some great programs. I mean, the Graduate School of Political Management where I taught, um, the IOP uh, over there, which is um, you know, a fantastic program. And then locally you have Georgetown and American, which also have uh, programs. We actually at Hopkins um, have a great political communications program that I can recommend. And you know, the one thing I would say too is that in between campaigns, people used to sort of like cycle off um, firms and stuff like that because they didn't have the money really to pay people. But now, um, health you know, just alone, healthcare issue advocacy advertising in 2019 was 65.3 million dollars. That's all going to people who are actually working in politics, and a lot of it is going to these firms. Who stick around after elections like mine. Opposition research has become an ever every year profession extending into the corporate and public affairs realms. And so sometimes corporations are in arguments with each other. And so you'll see, you know, oppo being thrown back and forth on them. You'll also see um, public affairs issues like we were talking about before. Um, you know, in healthcare, you'll see it on transportation. You'll see it with, you saw it with Build Back Better, for example. Um, a lot of money spent by the Chamber of Commerce, a lot of money spent by other organizations, pro and con. And so, you know, for Oppo, corporate reputation has become a must have. And 63% of your, the value of your business is reputation, and opposition research is one way to help manage it. And so, a lot of the stuff that we learned um, through campaigns is actually getting refined and modified for the corporate world and also for public affairs. Let's talk a little bit about tech. So this is a picture of what my Apple II Plus used to look like. <laughs> and that's my current iPhone. And so this had 64 kilobytes on my first Apple um, II Plus home computer. Um, you know, now we have Quizlet instead of the flashcard thing that I was writing. And now that's the number of bits that you have on my iPhone. And it's amazing how much how much you can do with them now. Um, you know, the founders did not envision, you know, the United States to your pocket, you know, or anything like that. And, you know, when I worked on my first campaign, voter data was not widely available. You had to actually ask um, the supervisor of elections or the um, state secretary of state of Florida, and you would get a data file that you would then have to import from a CSV file into a clunky thing. I mean, all, all this data now is much more refined um, it, we, it has, there's a lot more information on us, um, which is in one way creepy because, you know, frankly, I don't want everyone to know anything about me. Um, but also, it's sort of comforting because the kind of information that they're really going to want on me really is about my voting patterns. It's about, um, you know, the kinds of things that I'm interested in. So campaigns, the best kind of advertising, frankly, is the advertising that seems to speak to you. And the more that people know about you, uh, the more that they can reach you in a personal way. And so 235 million Americans are available in, in Aristotle's, excuse me, in Aristotle's national voter uh, file and 253 million are available in their consumer file. And all of this information now is available today. And over the next 10 years, the way I'm looking at it, 
is that campaigns are going to have to become more personal based on the data that they have on us. Is addressable television, is audio platforms, social networks, and all those kinds of things, and relational texting. All of this really pulls together all of this data into one place because having the data is one thing, but actually moving it in a way where you can actually reach voters is actually more interesting, right? In fact, 5 billion texts were reached in October 2020 alone, according to RoboKiller. That's a ton of texts. So some of you, I, I feel bad for your iPhones or your Androids. I mean, they're getting crushed out there. You can, by the way, for most real political um, ads on your phone, you can basically just say the word stop, and it will actually stop the text chain. They, they have to let you opt out. And so you're able to be able to get out of it. But the fact of the matter is that if you are this relational texting thing here, friends who are texting you are much more powerful than just somebody from a campaign. So campaigns now have decided that they're trying to find people through other people. And so they put together their phone list, almost like a phone tree, like you would for, you know, your baseball team or soccer team. You know, if something happens with the weather, you know, you call one person and they call two people. This is the same way that people were doing that for, um, or is basically called relational organizing. You'll hear, hear that term a lot now, and it's actually become more of a science now as opposed to just sort of a term that was aspirational. So precision now rests on the ability to sample populations from enhanced voter files. When I first started in polling, we would take random samples of phone numbers in a certain area code. Well, now that we can all take our phone numbers with us wherever we go, my wife actually has hers from Maryland when we moved to Virginia. I got one in Virginia. I decided to leave Maryland behind. You know, I became a Virginian. Uh, but now, because people will keep their phone numbers basically for their entire lives, the important thing is to know where you are and where you're registered to vote. And all those data points now are being used from where we sample individuals to go ahead and do our surveys. So we no longer say, well, we just want phone numbers, you know, in, you know, in Virginia, because that would lead out a whole lot of other people who have uh, phone numbers from elsewhere, right? So we now have to know where you are and where you're registered to vote. And that's how we do um, our science a little bit better now. And opposition research is now online. I mean, if you wanted to learn anything you wanted about me or a lot of things about me and my background, you can just go to my LinkedIn page or you can go to my Facebook page or you can look at my Twitter feed or you can look at other things and sort of put together what might look like, you know, a por uh, profile of who I am. And so, you know, all of that information now is available. And so when you do opposition research, um, the most important thing is not just the data or the thing that you think is the creepiest, but it tells a narrative about who this person is. Um, you know, se only 7% of Americans say they don't use the internet for any purpose. Let's talk a little bit about speed. So the speed at which politics moves now complicates how we can poll. So political engagement is now spiked by easy access to fundraising tools to deliver messages really fast. So. Five days is the number of days that a poll should be in the field. I mean, that's basically our version of what we think is the best practice. But in reality, we have much less time. And towards the end of a campaign, you know, when you're tracking, you're basically doing a rolling average of, you know, two or three days as opposed to five days. And the reason why you do five days is because you want to capture people who work on the weekends. You want to capture people who work during the day, you know, dur or, you know, during the week, during the day or at night or different parts of the day. Because there are a lot of people who have, you know, very different schedules than just, you know, sort of nine to five. And digital media advertising now commands about a quarter of presidential campaign budgets, which is incredible. If you think about it, it you know, digital media has only been around for maybe a decade or so, and it's now taken up a quarter of campaign budgets. But now, actually, when you're looking at down ballot races, they're spending much more money on um, this kind of uh, advertising because number one, it's cheaper. Number two, it's it's more easily addressable. And if you're looking at just a certain county or if you're looking at a set of counties, it's more efficient for your budget than actually buying like um, radio or TV or anything like that. 
So this is how much money outside groups are spending, and this is how much money political parties are spending. You know, in 2000, it was about 30%, and right now it's about 5% of ads that are aired. So here's, a, here's one from my background, and it's in the book, and there's a really funny story about it. And basically what it comes down to is this, is that the speed of today's oppo requires you to be able to counter immediately. And this happened, um, I guess, a few years ago. You know, Ted, we were trying to primary Ted Yoho, who was sort of a proto-Trump guy. And um, except I think he was a little crazier. Um, our polling had Jake within 10 uh, before the oppo drop. Now, this is Jake, and this is him at his... Um, his is um church actually this is also jake this is um this is jake as a larper and it would be you know kind of okay i guess maybe in a democratic primary but in a republican primary and you know sort of the um the, the farmlands of florida you know very conservative very traditional this was actually a little too far out for them and uh it was really tough and you know this the problem really with the whole thing was that we were quite flat-footed because when you work with a candidate, the first thing that you say to your candidate is, is there something that I should know? And so when I was talking to my friend, um, who is the uh, general consultant on the on the campaign, he said, well, you know, there's, there's nothing about this guy that's very, very interesting. He's just sort of a Chamber of Commerce kind of Republican guy. He's married. They have a baby on the way. He's a nerd. He plays video games. I'm like, well, he's not a nerd because everyone plays video games. So, OK, fine. That, no big deal. But the problem was that, you know, after we took our poll, uh, and we found that we had a shot at winning within a couple of weeks, this dropped on redstate.com and all of a sudden this became a problem and, um, Jake did not win. Jake got destroyed. Um, Jake lost by 79%. In fact, Jake, um, was persuade was, I, we tried to persuade him to not go on the Colbert rapport, but he did anyway. And so, yeah, that happened. So I got a call from my friend who is the general consultant. He said to me, and this is after the whole, you know, thing that went on with, with the oppo drop. And he said to me, look, the Colbert Report called us. They said, you know, would you like to be on? And I was like, he goes, I'm either an idiot or I'm a genius. And I'm like, look, if you have to ask the question, you should know the answer. You're an idiot. This is terrible. Whatever you're going to tell me next is terrible. We shouldn't do it. And he described to me that Colbert wanted to have him on the show and sort of have fun with it and the whole thing. I was like, please don't do this. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. He said, okay, I'll bring it back to Jake. And Jake said, I'll do it. And I'm like, oh, we're doomed, right? And so that's why you end up 79% when you lose the primary. Um, this is very bad. If you went ahead and um, Google Jake Rush after this, I won't take up your time with it now, but let's just say this. Colbert shows up in a vampire outfit and wonders why Jake isn't. So needless to say, it did not go well for us. Field operations, you know, in between campaigns now, field operations has become wonderful. I mean, we obviously we do uh, field through Congress in your pocket. You can go ahead and click on that and you can email the chief of staff directly, not through something else. Um, there's a resist bot, which does a very good job as text messaging. Um, they do platform mobilization on phone to action. And then five calls is actually an app that I like also. Uh, allows you to call all of your representatives in your area. But Americans now drive policy debates armed with all this technology. And so you don't have to go to a rally. You don't have to go and, you know, take a Capitol Hill day and go down with a bunch of people and go meet with members of Congress. You can do all of this remotely. And one of the best examples was during COVID, you know, the National Restaurant Association, as you would imagine, was was really under COVID and it was awful for them. They were able to send over half a million messages um, during the shutdown through phone to actions advocacy platform. And there are a lot of platforms that do this, so it's, it's not something that you know they're the only people who do it. But it really shows you, you know, the power of being able to do this stuff now using technology very quickly and very professionally. And they attracted more than a hundred thousand new advocates, and they grew their list by thirty times. And as like I said earlier, is we really you know, politics right now is in the list development um, business. Barriers to engagement, you know, have been removed as mobilization is instant. You know, my dissertation was about healthcare reform and how important the Harry and Louise ads were, which was sort of the first public affairs campaign 
you know, HIA and NFIB spent 20 million on those ads. Um, and, you know, for, you know, in support of, um, you know, build back better, they only, they only spend 10 million. So now you know why, you know, in 1993, 94, why HIIA got ahead and why Build Back Better didn't um, make it over the finish line. So here's my contact information. I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you um, offline. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn at Michael David Cohen, um, all standard spellings. Uh, you can reach me um, at mcohen at cohenresearchgroup.com or you can DM me on Twitter at, at Michael Cohen. As you imagine, I get a lot of interesting uh, mentions and a lot of interesting uh, conversations with people who think I'm the other guy. Um, but I'd be more than happy to uh, take any of your questions and appreciate the opportunity. So we had one question, Michael. Um, so the size of the central um, campaign like offices, are they a lot smaller now or are they larger compared to maybe like 15, 20 years ago? I don't think that the central offices themselves are that much bigger. Right, but they have a lot more consultants on around them. So instead right. of just having an advertising firm, you now have a digital firm. You have a broadcast firm. Instead of just having pollsters, you might have people who do online polling versus traditional polling. Like there's there's been a bifurcation of all kinds of different vendors around campaigns. Right, but in many cases, some of the campaigns have actually been able to run better campaigns with fewer paid people. And more volunteers because um, they're able to go ahead and be much more efficient with their dollars because they can go ahead and do all these things, you know, electronically much faster and, you know, with higher precision. Yeah, I guess I was just referring to, yeah, like that, that makes sense. Just what, like, you know, with all these um, the phone banks and these text banks where people, you don't really have to, you know, you can get anyone to just go online and to type in emails or, or phone numbers. I feel like. I assume that's taken over from not going door to door and not you know knocking on people's doors and you know well, actually it's, it, it's actually supplementing. So like there's there's a lot of good academic research actually on the importance of meeting voters in person. So right. the best the, the best way to meet a voter is the is like yeah me to you except like me knocking on your door right. That's the right. best thing you can do. Everything right. else is how close of a of a relationship do you have with somebody. And so people are still knocking on doors. They're just being more efficient about it. Okay. You're getting fewer people knocking on your doors who you're not interested in at all because they know your voting patterns. So right. if you're a strong Democrat, you're not going to have any Republican candidates knock on your doors if you've gone to the last four primaries and voted Democrat. Right? Okay. If you've gone to the Democratic primary for the past four cycles, they've decided that you're probably not worth it. So we're not going to go and knock on your door. We may send you a flyer. We may do different things if we have extra money, but they won't go ahead and do sort of the, the most invisible things, you know? Okay. We had another question. Um, what are your opinion on, what are your opinion on local races like district supervisor? Uh, the, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, first of all, I think all of these, all of these campaigns are important. Okay. So right. to me, like I have a soft spot for some of these campaigns. When I first started out, I worked for the Republican Party of Florida and we were running state house races. Okay. And so, you know, that's like the, 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 the lowest level state wide race that you could run. Right. And so, you know, on county supervisor or even, you know, school board, more and more of those campaigns are becoming much more professional. Uh, they're becoming much better funded because you can now go ahead and raise money outside of the area. Um, with the politicization of school boards for good and bad, um, those have become races that have actually become better funded than you would have ever imagined even five years ago. And so with that budget, you can then spend a lot more money on Facebook ads that are geo-targeted, um, that are, you know, for, you know, A-B tested versus, you know, one or another population. So all of these campaigns now have far more resources and far more tools to be successful than ever before, whereas you would have a supervisor's race, you would literally just go knock on all the doors because that's the best you could do because you couldn't afford to do anything other than yard signs. You can afford to do anything more than phone banking. Now you can do, you know, Facebook ads or other targeted ads, you know, at a fraction of the cost that you could have, that, you know, the, the cost to entry to this is much, much lower. Um, we had a question about the, by the way, Jeremy, I, I really do. I, thought, yeah. I actually do. I, I think, 
I think people running real campaigns for local races is better because you get to know who right. these people are. Because in most cases, you know, 5, 10, 15, 25 years ago, even now, you don't know who these people are. And it's right. because there's been no marketing around them because they didn't, weren't able to raise money or spend it in such a way that you could actually learn who they are. And I think it's important for us to know them. Okay, definitely. We had a question about uh, best uh, sources for big fundraising. Best sources for big fundraising. Okay, if you're if you're an R, um, you use their platform. If you're a D, you use their platform. <laughs> and so, yeah, th these platforms are are definitely. There's a set of platforms on the right, and there's a set of platforms on the left, and you can basically go ahead and use them, um, you know, for relatively low cost, and you can then put them on your website and you can use them that way. So, yeah, right. we had a question about um, the increase in um, from 2016 to 2020. What what was the increase? Where did that money go towards? Is there a specific sector that that boosted those numbers to the extremes that they did? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it ended up being the explosion of on, of online individual um, fundraising. And so what, one of the things the Trump campaign did extraordinarily well in 2016, and also, um, you know, Clinton was no slouch either, but they were masters at um, getting people to help raise money for them. So there were text chains, there was a lot of Facebook ads, there was a lot of sort of a lot of social media around it. And so a lot of that brought in money off the street that frankly wouldn't normally come. And in addition, for people who would donate $10, they got those people to donate $20 because they were able to go back to them and it wasn't a high cost to go ahead and do that. So that was a really big explosion between those two times. Okay, cool. Any questions? Um, do we have any more questions? Looks like that was the last one. So. Uh... I'd like to thank you, Michael, for your time. And like, like he said, if you um, the book, his book is available. So if you want to go to the Loudoun County uh, Public Library website, you can reserve it, and also I'm sure order it online. And uh, like I said, I've I've read the introduction, and you'd be surprised how funny it is, and there's some really some great stories. And like I said, there's not a more you know topical subject. Well, actually, we have one more uh, or another question oh, has popped cool. up. What what platforms are good for the for left for I guess Democrats? Um, for the fundraising. God, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Um, I, I think it's blue something or other. Um, it's it's in the book. I know that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I don't read the book. Um, yeah, you have to read, read the book. For... It, it, it's win red on the right and it's act blue on the left. That's what it is. Okay. Act blue is the biggest one on the left and win red is the biggest one on the right. And by the way, act blue was out about 10 years ahead of win red. And they had a huge, uh, because the Obama team was just fantastic and they seeded these people and they did a wonderful job of like sort of filling the ecosystem, the electronic ecosystem of fundraising. And so um, Act Blue became um, the sort of de facto fundraising arm for the Democrats. But there's, there's, there's a lot of others, to be honest. I mean, a lot of the, the big groups that I talk about in the book, um, they actually have, you know, a lot of the platforms now do fundraising, but they also do, um, you know, canvassing. They also do, um, you know, you know, fundraising. I mean, all of this kind of stuff together is becoming like, you know, it starts off where like, you know, you have a little bit of a tool and then it becomes part of the platform. It's, you know, it's kind of like, um, a lot of the things that you're seeing in technology wise, right? Like Instagram yeah. started off as its own app. It got bought out by Facebook. And so a lot of the big. Quote unquote Facebooks of politics have fundraising arms. So even though um, Win Red and Act Blue are the main ones that you'll see, um, there are a lot of other platforms that basically do this very well and in a more integrated way to how you would run your campaign. Okay. Well, good question. I'm sorry. I, I didn't get in my brain because I don't know. It's like, you know, you write the thing and it's like, oh, yeah, it's probably on page, I don't know, 86. <laughs> We're, we're in the back. I mean, it's there somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair point. And uh, but again, a lot of options on both sides. But but um, Act Blue is on the left. Okay, cool, awesome. Well, um, thank you for everyone for um for taking part in this, and thank you, Michael. We appreciate it. And uh, we may have another one of these uh, in the upcoming months. So keep looking on the library website, programming website, and we'll update it. So uh, thank you once again, Michael. 
Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank